Hi everyone, welcome to this presentation. In this video we are going to see how to model a power factor correction stage. This is the outline of the presentation. We will see an introduction, then the static modeling and the dynamic modeling of the PF PFC stage. And finally we will see some LTSPICE simulations that we can use to check the study of our power factor correction state. This video is a continuation of two previous videos, Power Electronics number 3, ultra fast modeling of DC DC converters in continuous conduction mode, and Power Electronics number 8, ultra fast modeling of DC DC converters in discontinuous conduction mode. We are going to use the back boost converter as power factor correction stage. We can see here the input of the line, then we have the EMI filter, a rectifier, and then here we can see the back boost converter. We know that when this converter is operated in this continuous conduction mode for the whole line period, then the line is going to see at this point here and our converter is going to behave like a resistance and this resistance as we are going to see later can be calculated with this value here 2 times LF divided by D squared where D is the duty cycle at which we are operating our converter so from the point of view of the line we are going to have um, waveforms like this one in which we have the sinusoidal input voltage and then a sinusoidal input current which is going to be in phase with the input voltage. We can analyze this converter very easily to obtain, for example, the DC output voltage that we are going to have at the output of our converter by equaling input power and output power. For example, here we can calculate the input power, the average input power, which is 1 over 2 times the peak voltage of the line times the peak current. And because we know that the converter is behaving like a resistance from the point of view of the line then we can obtain this expression here because IG is calculated as VG divided by RG then also we know that the output power is going to be like this VO squared divided by R by the load so by considering approximately 100% efficiency then both powers are going to be equal and then we can obtain this expression here for the DC output voltage of our converter. For this converter it is also interesting to calculate the voltage ripple that we are going to have at the output. This voltage ripple is going to be superposed to the DC voltage that we have at the output. We can do this by equaling the instantaneous input power that we have at the input of our converter with the instantaneous power that we are injecting into the net formed by the load and the capacitor. So the instantaneous input power can be calculated with this expression here because at the end the converter is behaving like a resistance for the grid. So it is going to be equal to the instantaneous input voltage squared divided by Rg, which is the equivalent resistance of our converter. And the instantaneous power that we are injecting here in this RC net can be calculated by multiplying the instantaneous current here being injecting times the voltage VO. We can assume that the voltage VO is going to be approximately constant, so we get this expression here. So by equaling these two instantaneous powers, then we can obtain this expression for the instantaneous current that is being injected into the RC net. And we get finally this expression here. In this expression, if we use this trigonometric equivalence, then finally we can obtain for this current that we have these two components, the alternating component that is going to circulate through the capacitor C and the DC component that is going into the load resistance. 
and then by knowing the AC component of the current that is circulating through the capacitor and multiplying this component by the reactance of the capacitor, then we can finally obtain the ripple that we are going to have at the output and we get this expression here. Now we are going to see a more detailed analysis of our converter. We have here the schematic of the back boost converter. Now IS represents the current through the switch, ID is the current through the diode and IL is the current through the inductor. We have here the waveforms and the different waveforms that we have in these elements the current through the inductor, the current through the switch and the current through the diode. This is the common analysis of a back boost converter operating in discontinuous conduction mode. From these waveforms we can get the peak value of the current IP which is the, uh, the peak value of the different triangular waveforms. And as we have seen in previous videos, in order to model our converter we need to calculate the average current through the switch and the average current through the diodes. This will be something like this one, the average current circulating through the switch. And this will be obtained with this expression here. Now, from the average current through the switch and using also the input voltage, then we can calculate the expression of the equivalent input resistance of our converter, which will be VI divided by the average current through the switch and then we obtain this expression that we have seen in previous slides is the value of the equivalent resistance of our converter. We need also the average current through the diode which will be this value here and this is very easy to do and we obtain this other expression here for this average current through the diode. Finally, we need to assure that our converter is going to operate in discontinuous conduction mode within the whole line period. So we need that this delta, delta T time, this interval here, has to be greater than zero. So the current through the inductor has to reach zero before the end of the period. So we are going to start with a zero current in the next period again. So if we calculate the value of delta T and apply this condition, then we will get finally this expression in which in order to operate in this continuous conduction mode, we need that the output voltage VO be higher than this value here, the over 1 minus D times the peak line voltage. And with this, we can draw the average equivalent circuit of our converter. We have here the input voltage, the average current through the switch, the average current through the diode, and the other elements in our converter. We can see that now the effect of the switching frequency is not present, but we have still the effect of the line frequency because this input voltage is changing at line frequency and then it is affecting these values here of the average current through the switch and the average current through the diode. So we need to perform a second averaging process in order to get rid also of the line frequency effect and have only the effect corresponding to the DC values in which we are interested. In this type of converters, of power factor correction converters, we are interested in the dynamic response well below double the line frequency. So now we perform a second averaging process to get rid of the effect of the double line frequency. For example, for the input voltage, which is going to be a waveform like this one, then we do the averaging of the input voltage and then we get this well-known expression, two times the peak value Vg divided by pi. 
and same thing with the other expressions with the uh, average current through the switch which is changing with the input voltage then we get this expression for the uh, second average uh, value and same thing with the current through the diode and then we get this expression here and then we get this equivalent circuit here in which we have average both the switching frequency and the line frequency. Now we can use our equivalent circuit to study both the static and the dynamic behavior of our converter. Here, for example, we have the DC operation of our power factor correction stage in which we have to consider that in our equivalent circuit all the variables are the DC variables. Also, the inductance is going to behave like a short circuit and the capacitor is going to behave like an open circuit. So by analyzing this equivalent circuit now we can obtain the output current IO and the output voltage will be the output current times the resistance so we can get finally this expression VO for the DC output voltage of our converter which is the same as the one that we have seen at the beginning of this presentation. Now we can go ahead and do the dynamic analysis of our PFC stage and for this we need to introduce, introduce perturbations in the different variables. So now all the variables we are going to consider that the DC values can change in time. So these variables, the duty cycle, the uh, peak line voltage, the output voltage, they can be considered as time varying variables. So we are going to consider perturbations in the peak line voltage, in the duty cycle here and also in the output voltage. For example, we can obtain the perturbation of the input voltage by taking the partial derivative of the input voltage over the only variable that depends the input voltage which is the peak line voltage. So we obtain this expression and with this parameter here chi ig which is this partial derivative then we can obtain how it is going to change the input voltage perturbation. In the same way we can calculate the perturbation in the current through the switch by taking the different uh, partial derivatives that in this case depend on the perturbations on the duty cycle and also on the peak line voltage and similarly for the perturbation on the uh, current through the diode which is going to depend on the perturbation of duty cycle peak line voltage and output voltage so at the end we have all these parameters here that are obtained from the different partial derivatives and by evaluating these partial derivatives at the DC operating point of the converter. This is our resulting circuit in Laplace domain with all the elements and here also we have the values for all the different coefficients in our equivalent circuit and from this equivalent circuit we can obtain the different transfer function that we are interested on. For example, for the case of the duty cycle to output voltage transfer function, in this case we have to make zero the perturbations coming from the peak line voltage. So we are going to have a short circuit here for the uh, voltage source at the input and for these other current sources we have an open circuit. So the final circuit is like this one. By analyzing this circuit, which is very easy, then we can obtain the output voltage, the output current, and from this, the relationship between the output voltage perturbations and the duty cycle perturbations. And we obtain this transfer function with a DC value, a zero at this frequency, omega C, and also a pole uh, at this frequency, omega P. These are the different values for the DC gain and also for the two frequencies of the uh, zero and the pole.
So we can see that our power factor correction stage is going to behave as a first order circuit. If we want to obtain the audio susceptibility transfer function, then we need to make a zero the perturbations coming from the duty cycle and consider only perturbation coming from the line voltage VEG. So in this case, we are going to have an open circuit at this point and also here at this point, and then we need to solve this circuit. By obtaining the different equations, then we can obtain the final transfer function GG, which is VO over VG, and then we obtain this expression here, which is the same dynamics and the only only difference is on the uh, DC um, value that we have for this transfer function that can be calculated using this expression here. We can also obtain the input impedance of our converter defined as the ratio between the perturbation in the peak line voltage over the perturbations on the uh, peak line current. So in this case, we have to make zero again the uh, perturbations on the duty cycle and then solving the circuit, but to obtain the ratio between uh, MVG and also IEG. So it is again very easy to do this and we can obtain this expression for the input impedance, which finally has this value here. PLF divided by D squared. So we can see that there is no dynamics for the behavior of the input impedance of the converter. Finally, for the output impedance of our converter, we make zero both perturbations on the duty cycle and on the peak line voltage. So we have this equivalent circuit only remaining this current source that depends on the output voltage. And we also add this current source at the output so we can calculate the perturbations of the output current. By analyzing the circuit, again, we obtain this expression here in which we have the same dynamics as before and then this DC value for the output impedance of the power factor correction converter. We can finally get the small signal model of our converter expressed as shown here in two ways. This will be in the behavior at the input of the converter and this will be the behavior of the output voltage of our converter when we are injecting perturbations on the peak line voltage, on the duty cycle, or on the output current of the converter. Other way to represent the behavior of our PFC converter would be like this, in which we have an equivalent circuit showing the input impedance of the converter, the output uh, voltage sources depending on the duty cycle and on the peak line voltage, and also including here the output impedance of the converter. Now we are going to see three ways to simulate our converter with different uh, simulation speeds and also with different accuracy. This schematic here shows the first possibility, which is to simulate the complete converter. We have the input voltage, the EMI filter, the rectifier. We have also here our switch with the control voltage here, the gate generating these uh, values and also the output stage with the inductor, the capacitor, the diode and the resistance. We are performing a transient simulation here up to 100 milliseconds and saving data from 60 milliseconds. The duty cycle is 0.35 and the switching frequency 50 kilohertz. So with this, of course, if we simulate this converter like this, we have all the required information. Also, we are including here in series with the inductor a series resistance of 50 milliohms and also 50 milliohms in series with the capacitor. 
This is here in blue because it is in this value, it is included directly in the model of the inductor. If I press here, we can see that the series resistance of the inductor is included here. And this is a good way to include uh, the series resistance of the inductor and also the capacitor because it is more efficient to do the simulation like this and compare to the other possibility, which would be the, um, the, the placing of a series resistance with the inductor. So now we can run the simulation and we will see that the simulation takes quite a lot of time to finish because we have to simulate the complete all the different switching periods and do all the uh, calculations within the switching frequency. So now we can see, for example, the output voltage here, which will be between these two points. And then we can see that the average voltage is around 210 volts. We can see this here. And with this voltage uh, ripple, we can change, for example, the scale here and represent until 200 250 in steps of 50 and from zero to see better that the ripple in reality is very small. We can add another pane and see, for example, the input current and the input voltage. For example, here can represent the input voltage and also the input current, which is the current through the EMI filter inductor. And we can see the current in green okay so it is quite sinusoidal and following the input voltage with this maximum value of 500 uh, milliamperes so we can see that with this circuit of course we can simulate everything even we can we could use a pwm circuit here to control the switch and then with this we could obtain the small signal response using the same methodology that we have seen in previous videos we have seen how to do this in this video lts is number six open loop frequency response of a dc dc converter however if we are not interested in what is happening at the switching frequency then we can use our average circuit this this circuit shown here is the average circuit in which uh, we are getting rid of the switching frequency this is the similar impl implementation at this one that we have seen before in which we are using these current sources and voltage sources in order to implement our circuit and these current sources depend on the uh, different parameters of our circuit the duty cycle the uh, inductance the switching frequency and so on but now we can see that this circuit is going to be much, much quicker to simulate. If we run the circuit, then now we can see that it is almost instantaneously. The simulation time is very, very short. So we can see here the output voltage. Now we have only information at uh, the line frequency. We don't have the information corresponding to the switching frequency. We can change here the scale again to see it better. Okay, and then we can add another pane and represent here, for example, the voltage at the input. And also we can see the current, which will be the current coming out of this voltage source. So I can I I I have to change here the sign. So we have these waveforms and we can see that they are very similar than the ones the waveforms before but without the information corresponding to the switching frequency.
In this average circuit, if we like, we can make different variables to change in time. For example, in this case, we are changing the duty cycle by using this voltage source. And then in the expressions of the current sources, we include here instead of the parameter D, we include the voltage VD, which is the voltage generated by this voltage source. So in this way, we can also include perturbations and see how the converter is uh, responding and also we could use uh, these methodologies that we have seen in previous uh, videos in order to obtain the frequency response of the converter so with this we can run the simulation and then we can see here in blue the duty cycle with the average value of 0.35 and the corresponding perturbation at 1 hertz and then we can see the output voltage which is the response with this uh, peak value and also with the ripple corresponding to double the line frequency. And finally, with this circuit, we can simulate the small signal behavior of our power factor correction converter. Here we have implemented the small signal in the same way as we have seen in the analysis. This circuit is equivalent to this one that we have seen before with the different uh, voltage source at the input and the different current sources representing the behavior of the um, current through the switch and through the diode. So here in this circuit, as we have seen, we are including all the current sources and also the voltage sources. We are injecting the changes in the, in the line voltage using this uh, voltage source here and in the duty cycle using this other voltage source here. And then with these uh, parameters here, we are generating the different coefficients for the current sources. So now, for example, we can include here a perturbation in the duty cycle. So we can select here, better see this way. We can uh, include here a perturbation of one volt amplitude. And then by doing this AC analysis that we can do in LTS spice, then we can obtain directly the transfer function of our converter. In this case, the output voltage versus the end duty cycle. Note that in this case, we can use directly the dot AC analysis of LTS spice because we have now directly a linear circuit. We don't have any uh, non-linear element in our circuit, so we can use directly the AC behavior and we can see that this is going to be very quick. So now we can run here the simulation and then we can see the output voltage and directly we have in dBs and the gain in the solid line we have the gain of the output voltage over duty cycle because the injecting signal is a duty cycle and is one volt and in the discontinuous line we can see the phase of the this uh, transfer function. If we compare this with the theoretical analysis, we will see that it matches perfectly well. So we have this um, gain here, a pole at low frequencies, and then we have this zero here at higher frequency due to the effect of the serial resistance of the capacitor. We can obtain also the other transfer functions, for example, for the case of the audio susceptibility, we inject here through the peak line voltage an AC signal of 1 volt and then check the value of the output voltage. So if we run the simulation, then we obtain this again this transfer function in which we have the DC gain, the same pole and the same zero because the dynamics is the same. The only change that we have compared with the volt, uh, output voltage versus duty cycle is on the DC gain of the audio susceptibility transfer function. 
Also, using this, um, this same schematic, we can obtain the input impedance of our converter because we are injecting here the perturbation on the peak line voltage. So we only have to measure the current entering here into the converter. So if we measure here the current and see the results, we can remove this one. So now we must note that what we are representing here is the input current versus the peak line voltage. So actually what we are seeing here is the input admittance instead of the input impedance. But at the end the input impedance will be instead of minus 61.2 dB, it will be 61.2 dB ohms. Okay, And also the phase... Here is minus 180 degrees, but the real phase is 0 degrees because we are measuring the, cu the current entering into the voltage source, but the actual current will be coming out of the voltage source. But at the end, we can see that there is no dynamics in the input impedance as expected from the theoretical analysis. And finally, to obtain the output impedance transfer function, we have added here this current source at the output and then by selecting here an amplitude, AC amplitude of 1 ampere, then we can run the simulation and see the results. So we can see again that we have the same dynamics with the same pole and, and zero. And now the DC value of the output impedance is around 49 dB ohms, which is also in accordance with the theoretical analysis. Well, this is all today. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope this presentation is interesting to you. Please let me know if you have any comment or question and see you in the next video. Goodbye now.